Hello and welcome to episode 70 of the Page One Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Derek. And thanks for joining us at the Page One Podcast, where we like to speak to writers of all kinds about their writing careers, how they got into the industry, and try and get as many hints and tips as possible. And as I said at the start, it is the 70th episode, which is quite the landmark. 70 episodes, quite a milestone, isn't it? So yeah. who would have thought we'd be here today after... When, 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 did, when did we even start this podcast? It feels like it was, what, 20 years ago now? <laughs> well, yeah, there has been a pandemic in <laughs> that between. Might be a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> but yeah, no, there are a lot of great episodes in, in the back catalogue there. We've had uh, some great guests like Sarah Pimbra, Nick Hornby, uh, Chris Brookmeyer. Uh, I'm just trying to think of random names. Every guest we've had has, has had something... Been uh, wonderful. Yeah, something way. unique and interesting to say. So do check out the back catalogue. Um, because there's a, a lot of great guests we've had on, but we do have another great guest this week. We have another fantastic guest. This week we are chatting with Miranda Malins, who is a writer, a historian, a lawyer, and she's already put me to shame with the achievements that she's done. <laughs> exactly. Me, but that's fine. <laughs> well, you're two of those things, Derek. <laughs> well, that's true, I suppose. You need to get the historian badge, then, I'll, <laughs> then I can even footing uh, but at the moment uh, yeah she's still a little bit ahead of me but she's written a fantastic book called the puritan princess which is a historical um true life uh, quasi fictional telling of the cromwell years when uh, he was in charge of the uk back when charles the first was old head chopped off yeah during the english civil war and it, the book focuses on um cromwell's daughter who's perhaps a lesser known character and actually we chat to Miranda about that about you know writing historical fiction and how it can be interesting to focus on the edges of all these historical moments that people know so you focus on the characters around the edges of that and the the events around the edges of that often is more interesting than the sort of big events that, that that people do actually know. Yeah, I think it's quite hard when you're writing uh, about an event that either everyone knows about or is really well documented and you're kind of just going through the motions and there's it's hard to get that kind of um, fire, that imagination really going. But I think if you can take it and just do something on the outskirts or find a new way in, I think that's, for a writer, that's maybe the more interesting angle. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because Miranda, as we say, is also his, a historian as well and she writes uh, history articles and and books as well. She she did work in academia before she became a lawyer. So, um, and we chat about, you know, writing history doesn't need to be a dry thing in and of itself either. You know, I th- in fact, I think that certainly speaking from my days as a school pupil, it was always the really dry <laughs> books that were the worst. But you want to read something that has a bit of flavour, a bit of character that that draws totally. you into, it, even when it's a, a historical book. But I think well, she... Marco, you you're a, a real life um, factual writer at the moment. Do you, you what's your what's your top tips for for trying to get? I, I write about the law, when... Tarek. It's very difficult. <laughs> what are you it's very to very difficult to uh, <laughs> to bring life to that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, always always you try and find you find a way for uh, people to to find a way into the topic that you're discussing that they might not otherwise be interested in. Exactly, so w- yeah. we, we chat to Miranda about all of that and also about, you know, how that differs from her fiction writing as well and the sort of difference between authenticity and accuracy, which I think can, if you veer too much one way, the book can end up a bit being a bit too dry. But um, we'll get straight into it after a quick advert for our page one notebook. And then uh, we'll be back at the end of the podcast with a bit more chat and to let you know about next week's guest. But for now, on with the podcast. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. 
As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying, or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made page one. Page one is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realised you need to plan how to let people read it, so we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic, or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. always start the podcast by asking if you always want to be a writer, but obviously you have had quite a different path into it. I think it's fair to say you, you with, his, with the history background and the legal background as well. Yes. So, I mean, it's such an interesting question, isn't it? Where does this all come from? Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, looking back, I, I always loved writing and um, reading as a child um particularly I was lucky um you know I come from a very um loquacious uh, bookish kind of family both my parents are lawyers um <laughs> so, well lucky and unlucky unlucky in other ways <laughs> to have lawyers for parents um <clears throat> but it, it did mean that I think I grew up just with knowing that words were really important and really helpful and uh, I was also the youngest um and so I had to kind of make myself understood and intelligible because otherwise you know why why would any of my family pay attention to me because <laughs> I was quite I was the youngest by quite some margin as well um so yeah I think I I dabbled a lot I did I wrote a lot of bad poetry um when I was young and uh, uh little sort of novels I found one the other day actually a little notebook which said very pretentiously something like my first novel <laughs> it was in this sort of nine-year-old or ten-year-old scrawl so clearly <laughs> clearly I did want to do it um but uh and, and yeah and as a family we even actually used to put on like silly plays we'd written ourselves uh, we even did one amazingly on the execution of Charles the first when I was really young so, I mean that's got to be absolutely the formative experience I think that <laughs> led me in this direction um and I but I read lots and lots and I think that's probably what all writers have in common at the start mm -hmm. um particularly loved historical fiction love Bernard Cornwell and Sharp, Hornblower, Philippa Gregory um but then actually gradually the I, I started doing a bit less creative writing and started really falling in love with history itself um I loved English literature and history at school but kind of history ended up being my my passion um, and I was lucky I, I was taken to a lot of literary festivals actually when I was young um, uh, well way before they were as fashionable as they are now we used to go to um, the Hay Festival when it was just literally just one tent in a car park um, and now obviously it's this huge huge occasion mm. um, and I think those experiences were seminal I mean it became a kind of lifetime ambition to be up on that stage at Hay talking um, so I, I think the writing was always was always there. Um, but as you alluded to, I, I, I went in the kind of history direction and um, went to university and studied history. I ended up staying for seven years um, doing a coming out with a PhD. Um, and then again, it was the it was the academic kind of side of it that I, I really loved and the Civil War period in particular, which mm -hmm. just absolutely got inside me and is still my my number one passion um uh, but I think actually I always took with me a sort of creative and dramatic element in my writing funnily enough I was pulled up on it actually a lot as a student <laughs> <laughs> because I could try to write some serious essay uh, uh or you know thesis and I I could never resist opening a chapter with you know five cloaked 
riders came through the night, you know, over the hill with a message, you know, kind of thing. Um, so my, my long suffering supervisor would just like strike it through in red pen, (laughs) you know, save it for the novel. (laughs) Um, But it was partly because also the period I specialized in the English civil war and the, the aftermath is such a dramatic period. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't need to make this stuff up. It happened. The spies and the, and the, um, and the, and the, uh, assassination plots and the fighting and all that stuff's really there. Um, so I guess it was always it was always within me. It's um, it's funny that because actually yeah. I'm for for something I'm writing I'm, I'm I've been reading some history books and yeah if if you're depending on the the time period I think it is acceptable and actually it can be quite a good way to get into history if if some of these books are written in that sort of way that you know it, it really pulls you into the period I think rather than a sort of stay dry history books that I remember from a school you know it's a different sort of way in I think I completely agree with you I think there's no excuse for writing any history however um specific and academic um there's no excuse for not writing it well and with with vivid writing Mm -hmm. and passion and you know wonderful descriptions because you know even writing um you know non-fiction history or, or, or kind of academic scholarship you're still telling stories really and you still want to engage the people that are reading reading your work um, <clears throat> I always felt when I was writing history I always wanted to be on that end of the spectrum you know yeah. writing the kind of fast-paced uh page turning stuff uh rather than the dry and dusty um, <laughs> tome that would be read by you know five people ever yeah. in a library <laughs> <laughs> I mean it, it sounds like you you have a an incredibly you know packed life up to the point of, up, up to now in, in in terms of the um the, the work you're doing doing for the phd the historical work then you were a, you're a lawyer as well and i do have to ask you know during all this time did you have this novel kind of inside you did you know this was what you wanted to write about and and, and was it just trying to find the time to fit it in or did it just kind of come to you one day and you think this is actually this is the perfect story for me um, the latter. That's a really good question. Um, I'd love to say I was some sort of you know genius, and this was burning inside me always, <laughs> my magnum opus. You know, but much more the latter. It, 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 it's like so many of us with with careers. You know, you just sort of follow your nose, don't you? Um, and you know, I, I loved doing history and, and and being an academic for a while, but then I, I got a bit spooked out of it. Actually, I think I felt that academia can be very remote and uh, you can be in your ivory tower and I was slightly missing that sense of connecting to a wider audience and bringing this period to more people Um, so I think that's why I kind of moved away from academia um, and then went um, very uh, very sensibly and boringly into (laughs) law (laughs) because it was something familiar something I thought that I would be good at and could make a kind of safe career out of um but actually it's really weird the way these things work out because i almost had to leave academia and go and have a commercial career and um, to find the um fiction writing within me mm-hmm. it's funny how that happened I, I had to get some distance from my period and from my specialism and actually go out to the real world <laughs> where people are trying to um you know, serve clients and pitch things and communicate properly. And that sort of business world was brilliant because it actually introduced me to um, so many great techniques about how to communicate well um, and how to sell yourself and how to sell your ideas. And then I just had this kind of magical dovetailing point um, just before I went on my first sort of maternity leave um, where I went on a holiday to America, to the southern states of America, uh, and um, did a bit of a kind of American Civil War pilgrimage and went to Margaret Mitchell's house mm-hmm. uh, in Atlanta. I love Gone with the Wind. And um, it was really inspiring because she's a very inspiring writer. And I just thought, you know, she wrote Gone with the Wind um, basically just about the, the southern side in the war. And I'd always wanted to write about the parliamentarian side in our English Civil War. And I thought, actually, maybe I could do it. So I started scribbling down some notes on an overnight train, playing with some ideas, got back home. A little bit later, I went on maternity leave and I thought, OK, you know, let me let's let's give this a go. And 
probably like many of your listeners, probably like both of you, the moment that I started kind of a few days into it, I was absolutely hooked. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, okay, wow, finally, I found it. This is what I want to do (laughs) with my life. So now I'm just trying to work out uh, uh, if I can, how I can do it, how I can make it my (laughs) my career. Well, I should should say that um, Marco and myself are also lawyers, so we completely appreciate uh, (laughs) anything to escape the absolute boredom of being, being a lawyer. That's absolutely... Yeah, let's not talk about Lord, <laughs> <laughs> that's the worst thing, isn't it? When you when you at a dinner party or a party, well, that gosh, that seems years ago, doesn't it? That we used to have yeah. parties. But you know, you find yourself sitting next to another lawyer, and I think, oh no, <laughs> we're gonna have some more chat. So I always, I always actually slightly hid the fact that I was a lawyer. I'd always introduce myself as a historian because I just thought it was so much more interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, and actually that is representative of how I feel about myself. I've always felt that I'm a historian first, lawyer second, um, and now writer, novelist, you know, still working out <laughs> where that fits yeah. in. So, so um, you started working on uh, what became presumably the Puritan princess at that time. Um, is, was that was that the story that you were writing at the time? Or? Actually, it wasn't. And I know this is so, so common, isn't it? That um, so often you, you write one book um, and then actually it's your second book that mm-hmm. gets picked up. So I'm sure, again, a lot of your listeners will, will have this experience. Um, the book that I was writing or wrote on my first sort of maternity leave um, was set in the same period. Uh, so the English Civil War and the aftermath. Um, but it was more um, pure fiction. Um, right. It was a fictionalised family, a fictionalised plot. Um, but there were some real characters in it, like Oliver Cromwell was in it. Um, and But the, the the brilliant thing about starting with that book was that it taught me so much about how to write. And it also showed me that I could do it. Um, and it, it also um, uh, won me my agent. Um, and then we we tried to, well, we pitched that book to publishers who decided not to go for it, which was a huge disappointment um, and setback. Um, But they were interested in the idea that my agent had pitched as a possible second book, which was The Puritan Princess. Um, So they said, go away and write that book. (laughs) And I said, oh, (laughs) oh no, I can't possibly. I've just gone back to work. I can't (laughs) write a whole nother book now. Um, But, uh, you know, I was, I felt very sorry for myself for a weekend and, and and probably you know drank a lot of wine, ate a lot of ice cream, moped about, and then I on the Monday I started writing the Puritan Princess, and that that was the book that uh, you know that was what turned out to be my debut novel, and you know got me my two book deal. So these yeah. things work out hopefully. No, that's it. <laughs> so but it's, it's it's a great um, example of of you know what others have said to us, and what we always try and say is. You know, you will always get setbacks in this. Mm-hmm. You know, if you if you're trying to be a writer, and you you just have to keep believing in your writing and keep yeah. pushing for it. I think that to make sure it'll, um, you know, you will get there eventually if your if your writing's good enough. I mean, you said your first one got you your agent. I mean, was that quite a quick process, or was it the the you know lots of submissions? How, how did no, that come about? Yeah, really, really protracted. Mm. Um, Actually, the, the first thing that I did, I was thinking about this earlier when I was um, uh, um, <clears throat> preparing for the podcast, <clears throat> I was thinking about how, how I got to where I am. And actually, the first thing that I did, even before I started writing my first book, was that I <clears throat> went to a historical fiction writing masterclass afternoon at the Chalk Valley History Festival. And um, I actually took a day off work and <laughs> drove out to Wiltshire for it, very much on spec, because I haven't even started writing my first mm-hmm. book at that point. Um, but again, it was it was just it's really good to do that kind of thing, because it just sort of almost you're almost telling yourself that you're serious about this. Um, and I got the opportunity to meet a few agents and um, publishers there. Um, they didn't end up being my agent or my publisher, but, you know, they listened to my idea. They thought it sounded good. They were encouraging. And again, that gave me the spur to go away and write. It's very hard to write, isn't it, when you're starting out because you're in a vacuum mm. and you've no yeah. idea if anyone's ever going to read what, you, what you're what you writing, if you're any good at it. Um, it. It's really, really hard to motivate yourself. And so to, to know there was somebody in the industry um, who would read what I wrote, um, if I you know, went away and did it, yeah. was hugely um, helpful. 
Um, so <clears throat> that helped me write the book. Um, but then in terms of getting, eventually getting my agent, it was the age old story of lots and lots and lots of submissions um, and all sorts of little things I tried to do. I went to a creative writing um, fair up in Manchester where you, um, uh, you had pitch slots with agents. You had right. a kind of 10 minutes mm -hmm. one on one appointment with a couple of agents and got to pitch. Again, um, none of those people ended up being my agent, but again, it was great experience um, and helped me hone my pitch. Um, but actually, I eventually um, secured my agent through his slush pile. It was just one of many, 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 many applications. <laughs> and, you know, thank goodness it, it, it came good. So again, anyone listening who, who's doing lots and lots of submissions, it only needs one, you know, you only need yeah. one to read it and think, oh, I like the sound of that. And you're in. Yeah, absolutely. And I was interested about, you know, when you look at your 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 books, your historical fiction books and the whole topic of historical fiction, you know, you've done a lot of writing and research in that area as prior to writing the, the book as part of the PhD, et cetera. And with historical fiction, you know, how how what's the balance there between mm. the fiction and the fact? Because so much of it is is true, obviously, and you're kind of trying to balance that thrilling story to keep people engaged, but mm. also want to be, to be real. And and where where does the line between artistic license and and real life, or is it, is it a blurred line? And how how do how do you write? <laughs> yeah, that? well, <clears throat> the key the key word you use there is balance. I mean, there is a there is a balancing act, a circus trick at the center of all historical fiction, um, I think, which is that balance between providing the historical information in the background, but never letting that history get in the way of the plot. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a constant balancing act. And I'd say almost um, the majority of my edits when I'm editing with my publisher, uh, um, a lot of them come down to that question. Um, <clears throat> and it's sorry, excuse me. And it's really difficult because especially in my period, which is actually quite, uh, it is not very well known mm -hmm. and is very politically complicated. Yeah. Um, but you, you know, you want to provide the reader with as much information as they need to get the most out of your story. Um, but it can never feel like a history lesson. You know, if it feels too slow and too labored and too much like a lecture, then people, people will switch off. Um, so I, I think, uh, there, there is a distinction, I think, between history and historical fiction. And, but I feel very strongly that the two shouldn't be in competition with each other. And yeah. um, this idea, this, which was very fashionable, you know, up until relatively recently, that historical fiction was the poor relation to history and was just a lot of bodice rippers and fluff and swords and sandals <laughs> and you know, yeah. didn't deserve to be taken seriously. And um, thank goodness, largely thanks to Hilary Mantel, we live in a post-Wolf Hall era yeah. where um, right stories set in the past are, you know, really popular now and there's a bit of a renaissance happening. Um, and, and I think, but, but again, you know, you're the best, the best historical fiction and certainly the historical fiction that I'm trying to write is completely grounded in what actually happened. Um, so all the characters in the Puritan princess are the real people, right down to the servants at the court are all the real people. Cool. Um, and I worked really hard to um, establish who was where, when, you know, who was sitting in the council meetings on any day, uh, what day of the week things happened, um, <clears throat> things like that, just to make sure it really, it really could be as, um, as true a, an account of certainly the events that happened um, mm -hmm. but as as you alluded to you know that's your skeleton that's your framework <clears throat> but to write a really pulsy and exciting novel you've got to imagine a lot of scenes and a lot of relationships and dialogue that you layer around that um, so uh, yeah it's 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 a balance between the two but hopefully I, I struck it <laughs> correctly and when when do you know how much is okay to bend or break you know is if, if it's combining characters or moving a meeting to another day you know is there a limit to how much you would change yeah I <clears throat> I'd say I I did really try to keep as much real as possible I guess what I would say is what whatever I knew to be true I didn't mess around with okay um so I didn't have people in places they weren't I didn't merge characters um I didn't it, it, there is that sense when you're writing about real people, and this is a distinction within the genre of historical fiction between mm -hmm. 
stories which are about fictional characters against a real backdrop. <clears throat> so Gone with the Wind, as I was mentioning earlier, or A Suitable Boy or something like that, um, or, or, or War and Peace, or and also the kind of fiction um, uh, Wolf Hall, which is really all about real people. Um, and the Puritan princess is the latter. Uh, it's about the real people and what they're actually doing. It, it can, it is a constraint. I mean, the, the 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 facts of what happened in terms of who married who, who dies when, who is where, you know, who's on which side of which argument. Um, it, those are constraints. Um, but I think actually, I found it quite helpful and inspiring in a sense to have those constraints because it, my challenge was to work within those constraints but massage the facts sufficiently to uh, bring out a really exciting story yeah just 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 an example of that for instance um is uh, the the voice that you use the perspective you use so the puritan princess is written in the is the first person present tense and it's through the eyes of oliver cromwell's youngest daughter francis um now the fact that the whole book is through her eyes obviously puts a constraint on what which scenes I could have. So I couldn't mm -hmm. have scenes happening in Parliament or in a council meeting because she wasn't there. Um, and actually, from the when I first started writing, I had to really find clever ways to work around that because otherwise you can find yourself writing a book from a female perspective, but which is no more than a sequence of scenes where a man comes in and delivers yeah. news. <laughs> yeah. Here's what happened in Parliament today. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, oh, mistress, hear the news from Parliament. You know, and you just think, oh, gosh, that's tedious. Um, so, but I think that's there's actually an opportunity there, I found, because it meant that I couldn't write all the tedious parliamentary things. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to. Um, so it, it almost took this huge canvas and shrank, shrunk it for me. Um, and I would say also that it's, it's quite nice if you are writing historical fiction, um, not to write the big scenes that everyone thinks they know, um, but to almost write what's happening around the edges of that, the backstage stories. Um, because I think that gives you an opportunity to be a bit more inventive and to do something a bit, a bit newer and fresher. And so when, you, when you're writing a story like this that, that does have that history in it, um, presumably you are someone that plans out your book before you write it as opposed to yeah. the pantsers, as they, as they call them. <laughs> yes, no, I, I have to be. I mean, I don't know, you know, if I wrote a different kind of book, whether I still would be. Um, but certainly for this kind of book, which is so pinned down to the historical record, you know, I, I had to start with this huge, long timeline, really, a sort of a sort of fleshed out timeline um, of what was happening uh, politically, um, what was happening personally within the Cromwell family, who was where uh, at any one time. And but actually, I found that helpful because when, when I looked at that all, you know, mapped out like that, I could start to see the structure of the book i could start mm -hmm. to see the big events the big turning points um and then structure the book around that <clears throat> if you see what i mean so i did need that that big amount of planning um but like any writer you know it it, it also there is an organic process yeah. and yeah. Um, as i was going you know things i thought were important receded other details you know emerged um characters began to form and 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 change things a little bit in terms of how I wanted to structure it. So it, it was a mixture, big, big plan, big, big timeline, and then, you know, put away all the history books and try and write in a more free style and see where it took me. Yeah, I, I was going to ask about that because obviously, you know, with any novel or with both novels, I suppose there's an element of research that goes into them to build for the world or whatever the characters mm -hmm. that they're doing. And obviously with a historical fiction novel there's there's a lot of that that sort of thing but the, the balance in these stories obviously is to try and give the feeling of that era and that time yeah. and these people but without it being you know without it turning into a history book I suppose that that must be the 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 tricky balancing act that, as you mentioned earlier absolutely um, I, I think that a good distinction to think about is that between authenticity and accuracy 
Mm -hmm. um, I think you can easily get lost down a wormhole of detail. Um, and sometimes that's great. And you really, it's really rewarding to get those little details, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I sent the, an early draft of the book to a few other historians for, the, for their comments. And one of them sent back the most wonderfully detailed <laughs> response with things like, uh, you have a character eating a pear at the wrong time of year, um, <laughs> which was brilliant. You know, they wouldn't be able to store it. It wouldn't have been fresh, whatever. Uh, and then similarly, something like, um, oh, my characters go out hawking. So, you know, like hunting, but mm. with, with, um, with birds, birds of prey. And again, this wonderful colleague of mine wrote back and said, um, you know, Merlins don't catch rabbits they catch smaller <laughs> birds so the bird on Cromwell's fist has to be eating you know and uh, I mean there's a silly examples but that that stuff you know you can just get lost you, you would yeah. never finish yeah. your book if you if 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 every tiny aspect has to be perfect um but that's where I think that what you should strive for what I strive for more is that feel for the time mm. is that sense of authenticity um so trying to have the characters uh characters sort of living with a mental landscape that feels real mm -hmm. um and as this especially comes through in dialogue um thinking about you know not having your characters reaching for a metaphor or a comparison or an idea mm -hmm. or concept which just wouldn't have existed then yeah um so that sort of thing all, all helps you get a feel you know feel like it's slightly of that of that time um but I think, you know, and again, this is another another piece of advice for other writers listening, um, that it you can get scared off, I think, writing fiction, particularly writing historical fiction, by that that quest for accuracy. Hmm. And you can, you, I, I mean, I remember I felt it a bit intimidating at the beginning, and I thought, oh, gosh, I need to know everything. I need to know every meal that someone's eating. I need to know exactly every detail of, their, of what they're wearing. Hmm. But then if you think about it, with modern, with contemporary fiction, we don't. It doesn't read like that. You know, you don't. You, you just hear that a character went for lunch. They don't. Yeah. An author doesn't say they had this flavor of sandwich, this bag of crisps. This, you know. Yeah. You don't actually have to have all that information. And I think if you if you dive into Hilary Mantel's books, um, you you can see that actually she doesn't waste time describing every detail of every room, every character, every meal. She picks out a few little details that really bring it to life and she doesn't say the rest yeah I, th really, I think that's really good writing i think that's right because i i can certainly think of some historical fiction that goes too far the other way and it it's actually it, it pulls you right out of it rather than rather than taking you into the story it's like this is obviously something that you're telling me because you've researched it and it, <laughs> yeah. it's not it's not yeah. moving the story for not to include yeah it. exactly yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, I mean, we've, we've sort of skirted around the edges of it, but do you want to tell us about the Puritan Princess and, and what it's about? Oh, yes, I'd love to. I'd love to. Well, it tells the story of um, the Cromwell family. So this is um, Oliver Cromwell, uh, and this, this is the years following the tumultuous civil wars of the 1640s um, between King and Parliament. And um, <clears throat> eventually... Uh, Cromwell comes to power himself as a Lord Protector, which was essentially king, really, in all but name. Um, and he moves into the royal palaces of Hampton Court and Whitehall with his huge family, including two unmarried teenage daughters, who become effectively princesses, really, and um, also suddenly find themselves as the greatest prizes on the international marriage market. Um, so the novel, the novel really um, takes us into Cromwell's court um, through the eyes of Frances and we follow her as she tries to find love and, uh, and fulfilment as well and as she has to um, make her way through the sort of triumph and the tragedy of what happens to her family. Um, so it's a, story, it's a story about kingship on the one hand uh, and courtship on the other so that's the sort of the political and the personal and they the the wonderful thing is that they get linked um, by in the life of Frances Cromwell because her marriage prospects end up being very intimately bound up with the greatest political question of the day which was whether her father Oliver would become king or not um so yes it's a story uh, well, hopefully it would appeal to uh, lovers of you know your traditional 
kind of Tudor court fiction as well. You know, someone who's mm-hmm. enjoyed Philippa Gregory, Hilary Mantel, uh, C.J. Sansom, because it's a it, a similar story of kind of power, intrigue, um, passion, uh, royal <laughs> royal uh, toings and froings. Um, but from our most revolutionary period, and all about this extraordinary and unique family who found themselves uh, the ruling family of their day for a few years, mm-hmm. despite being ordinary people who'd lived an ordinary life before then um, in relative obscurity. So when you're looking at this whole kind of area and you're trying to think, what, what, what's my next book could it be? What was it that drew you to this, to this part of history and to the character of Francis? Well, I, uh, I fell in love with this period years ago. I mean, really years ago, I think probably as a, probably doing my A-levels. Um, and then followed it all the way through through university. And, and it is just the most brilliant period because it is so inherently dramatic. As I said earlier, it's got everything. I mean, it's it's our really Britain's most uh, tumultuous uh, and um, devastating and bloody period of our history. Um, when, you know, we had this huge civil war raging um, and, and bringing, really giving birth to the modern age. It, it, it was a war not about who should rule, Uh, like the medieval Wars of Roses or kind of Game of Thrones style conflict, Mm -hmm. but it was about how they should rule. Um, And it tackled questions we're still dealing with today to do with political sovereignty, uh, legitimacy of power, um, you know, a a lot of the the, uh, uh, agonising over Brexit a few years ago was, you know, so similar and, and reached for so many parallels to this this extraordinary period yeah. and it's the it's the gap it's the anomaly in our really neat story of kings and queens mm. i mean you know we all remember growing up kind of learning your kings and queens on your wooden ruler william william henry stephen henry richard john edward 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 endless edwards <laughs> but there's this gap there's this weird 11 years right in the middle of it 1649 to 1660 um which just uh it's always it's skipped over or forgotten half the time sometimes on a timeline it might say commonwealth or it might say cromwell we we don't as a nation seem to know how to process this period it is completely swept under the carpet which just makes it catnip for for me yeah. <laughs> um, because I feel it's best it's both the most exciting bit of our history and the most overlooked bit of our history um so so that's why uh, and also as I said you know it is the beginning of so much of the modern age it's the first era of journalism news explosion of newspapers uh first so many um new opportunities for women as well coming out of the civil war um, and it's the birth of politics, um, you know, as we as we know it today. So the period, always, I just always loved it. Um, and I was, you know, always interested in Cromwell. So I did a, my, my PhD was about actually about the offer of the crown to Cromwell. So the very kingship crisis, which is the central political um, uh, problem in the novel, mm-hmm. uh, was actually what I wrote my PhD about. Um, but then it was just a few years ago when I started looking at the women in Cromwell's family, and I realised that they are completely forgotten about. They're just com- they're just totally marginalised from any history of this period, um, and yet they're so incredibly fascinating um, because, as I say, they they went from being normal people to being a royal family, uh, and then they disappear back into obscurity <clears throat> after that after their brief flurry of power into an obscurity in which I think they still languish. Um, So it was looking at them and then realizing, I I thought I want to write about these women. And then it soon became clear to me that actually fiction was gonna be the best vehicle for that. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, uh, you know, only really, I I would have to imagine a lot of the scenes and the relationships with them because we just don't have them in the historical record. And um, using fiction, I could really replace them at the center of, this period, which is where they should have always been. Um, So then when I was looking at the women in Cromwell's family, and there's a lot of them, he had an overwhelmingly female family, seven sisters, uh, four daughters, uh, innumerable nieces, a widowed mother, and he was surrounded by women for most of his life, which again is not something we think about when we think about the the, the door, stern, uh, uh, martial Cromwell, Mm. popular uh, mm-hmm. imagination when I was looking at these women Francis just leapt off the page for me um, because mostly because she had uh, a very exciting um, love affair uh, of the heart 
um, which uh, was all got bound up in this uh, issue of whether her father would become king. So that was such a such an exciting story that I just felt I had to tell. Also, from a very, very silly point of view, she's the youngest daughter and I'm the youngest of three sisters. <laughs> so I just felt that I naturally identified with her. I could sort of channel all my frustration about my own sibling issues <laughs> through her and her sisters. Um, so that's that's how uh, that's how I came to her. And she's so vivid. She may not be um, in the sources very much, the historical record, but where she is there, she is clearly very passionate, very determined, very loyal, also with a great sense of humour and a real flirt, which we get from some of her letters, which also really appealed to me. So I just thought I found I found my story. I found my heroine. You know, that's how I'm going to bring this period to life to a wider audience. And you said earlier that you've got a two book deal. Um, have you started working on the second book at this stage? I have. Um, yes, I'm editing it at the moment, so it's it's uh, it's complete, but uh, but being edited, um, and it's actually coming out in September, so uh, not too not too far away. Um, it's going to be a, a prequel in a sense. Um, it's actually going to look at Cromwell's life and times. A decade earlier in the 1640s and from the perspective of his eldest daughter Bridget right. who is a, a character secondary character in in the Puritan princess um, and a very very different woman from Francis so I'm, I'm taking a different angle uh, on on Cromwell um, but you get uh, uh, all the sort of civil war excitement the uh, <clears throat> trial and execution of the king the revolution all of that in the next book. Oh, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> and um, I think I'd read on a, a guest blog post that you did somewhere um, that you'd you talked about um, imposter syndrome a little bit and how you, you you kind of felt that when you were writing your your book. And I think that's something that I think a lot of writers can appreciate. And um, and and well, I kind of wanted to ask you what your views on it and, and how do you get past that? And is it is it a case of accepting it and moving on, or is there something that you do to actually validate yourself in some way well again a really good question um i think for me it was all very much bound up in the context um because uh i, I i've been a lockdown sufferer as <laughs> i mean obviously as have we all <laughs> um but the puritan princess you know came out in hardback literally like the week after lockdown, mm. the first lockdown started. Um, I also um, had my second baby a week later um, <laughs> and, and, he, and he was 10 weeks premature. So was in hospital for six oh, wow. weeks all the way through the first lockdown. Um, so it was a crazy, crazy surreal time. And I, I just had this feeling that uh, the book hadn't really come out <laughs> because mm -hmm. the bookshops yeah. were closed, you know, events weren't happening. I had to cancel my launch. And they, those all might sound sort of trivial and flippant things. But, you know, as, as your listeners know from writing, you know, you spend so many years and so many hours, hundreds of hours on your own writing something. Yeah. And then there is this magical moment. Um, and this was my first magical moment because it was my first book mm -hmm. where you put it out into the world and you give it to other people and it takes on a life of its own. Um, and I really miss those interactions. And, you know, I didn't see the people who were who were reading it, even within my own friends and family. I didn't see yeah. any of them, you know, yeah. to have that sort of chatter. What did you think? You know, so I, I still did feel a little bit like it hadn't really happened. Um, and now the paperback is coming out um, tomorrow. Uh, so in lockdown three. <laughs> I'm not doing very well with this. <laughs> so, um, but uh, yeah, so I think part, I think it was mostly bound up in the context, but I think, I think everyone feels that to an extent in their life, don't they? Um, you know, am, am I good enough? Kind of, can I really do this? And I yeah. think writing in particular, um, for the reason that I said, because I can't think of any other creative endeavor, really, that is, you have to put so much of yourself up front with no mm -hmm. guarantee that anything will come of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I've thought about this a lot. And I think, you know, with other artists, maybe, you know, musicians or, 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 or painters or, or people in other fields. Um, I, I feel like that it, it's, it's, there's more, there can be more of a gradual kind of building of one's career. You can be showing your work to people, you can be performing and just gradually working your way up, you know, the, the opportunities you have, the venues you have to perform. 
but with a writer it's all behind closed doors i mean it's just all internal and um you know you're you're living in your head all the time as well which is the means that you come and go don't you we all have days where we think you know we're, we're a genius and there are other days where we think <laughs> yeah. we don't know what the hell we're doing yeah. and, uh, you've got to battle that daily um and and hope and it all kind of comes down to this kind of awful um uh potluck in a lot of in a lot of senses really as to you know you were all longing for that moment of validation that mm. moment where we get an agent or we get a publishing deal or maybe we decide to self-publish or, or you know our, our work finds its way into readers hands and i i think it's a terribly it's a terribly sort of stressful and all or nothing kind of endeavor at least it can be i mean i think mm. those people who can just write and write every day because it's what they do, it's who they are, it's what they love, um, and can remain happy and motivated, even if no one really reads what they're doing, it's, it's just for them. I mean, I think that's wonderful, and I'm a huge admirer of someone who can write like that. Although, um, but I, I, yeah, yeah, I was always it, hoping it would go somewhere, and you know, that that's very difficult, isn't it? I mean, even, yeah, it, you know, we've, we've spoken to a lot of writers on the podcast and even sort of the big names have still feel that they still feel that even now I think when they're writing their books they, they, they still have a bit of that imposter syndrome about them I think it it's a natural thing especially because a book as you say it's solitary and it takes so long <laughs> you know yeah. it, you, you, there will be ups and downs with it absolutely and you know, even if you, especially writing prose, I think is the thing because if you write a screenplay, you you know we were speaking to um, Alex Garland who had written books and then moved into screenplays, and he you know he writes screenplays and he says that he can you know if a screenplay is not working he can cast it aside and more easily because it doesn't take as long, but if it's a book, to cast that aside is a very difficult thing. So it is it's a it's a it's a big project you're taking on, as you say, before you get that validation that, yeah, it's good it or, you know, we want to read it. It is. And it has such a life of its own, doesn't it? And such momentum. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've written three novels now. Um, and, you know, I, I just have this sense, you know, the, the first 20,000 words or so kind of comes quite easily mm. and I, I'm excited and then I get massively bogged down in the middle when you feel god I'm as far from the beginning as, yeah. uh, from the end as I am from the beginning <laughs> you know it's not good I can't see my way through this forest to the end um so I have sort of you know 30,000 to 60 70,000 words I sort of get really stuck and bogged mm. down and then again you know suddenly pick up again towards the end last 10 15 20,000 words it rushes through again uh, and you'll carry forward on this kind of surge of excitement because you think, oh, I'm only a few scenes, I'm only a chapter mm -hmm. or two away from the end. Um, and all of this is played out in your mind, isn't it? And on your own. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's a terribly intimate and emotional sort of process. Um, but he, I, I, I was lucky in a sense, I had a little bit of training for it with my PhD because that's a bit a bit like this because you have three years and at the end of it you've got to produce an 80,000 word thesis mm -hmm. which is kind of book length mm -hmm. um, and I remember someone saying to me when I started out with that that actually you, you get given your doctorate as much just for surviving <laughs> <laughs> to the other end of it than for anything you've written you know, you've got <laughs> so uh, I, I think once you know that once you've written one book I think you, you've, ta you've taught yourself something so valuable which is you can do that you can do it you can take an idea and you can turn it into a book, which is such a massive achievement. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you're always going to be able to have that. You know, whatever happens. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I have to ask: Is the ultimate goal for you to be able to take the the lawyer job and just scrunch up and <laughs> throw it in the bin, and then just never look back, set it on fire, and just never look back at it again? And then Tarek, you're projecting here. Sorry, this is. <laughs> I'm just weighing up my answer, thinking, am I going to share this link with any of my colleagues? Yeah. <laughs> so oh, I've said too much already. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, and I won't share it with any of my colleagues. Uh, yeah, ditch the law completely. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm very grateful to to it uh, and to my firm and my my team who've all been super supportive. Um, but yeah, you know, if, if I could if I could wish uh, the Puritan Princess into the bestseller charts. And the next book to start to make some money. <laughs> yeah. um, I'd love to make this my career, and I've got so many more book ideas. Um, both 
uh, both non-fiction and fiction actually i want to write both ultimately yeah. um and sort of uh, uh cross zigzag across that line that blurred line that you were mentioning earlier between fiction mm-hmm. historical fiction and history i kind of want to want to own that line zigzag across it uh, <laughs> because i'll enjoy that <laughs> um so so yeah but um you know it, it's as we all know it's such a struggle isn't it again it's mm-hmm. one of the problems where i think trying to be a writer you know is such a big ask and a big undertaking and such a brave thing to try and do um because uh you know you've got so much riding on it so much you've got to try and do up front and you you don't know if you're going to be able to make a career out of it and most writers you know do have other jobs don't they Mm. do other things on the side um you know it's very i'm very envious of those hugely successful writers who can be full-time writers and yeah. you know i know it's a real milestone isn't it for, for somebody if they can get to that point mm-hmm. and, and I, i'd absolutely love to i also have two small children i should say so um <laughs> i've got quite a few uh, few things going on <laughs> <laughs> and uh, obviously you've you've finished the or, or finished the draft of the second book um yeah. going through the edits and stuff but have you already in your head go the idea of what you want to write next yes i have i have i'm i'm just trying to find the time to um put my proposal together uh my i, I pitched a few ideas to my agent just before christmas actually and we we sort of settled on where we'd like to go next ideally um but uh, as with everything comes back to this idea as a writer you've got to do so much up front mm-hmm. um, because uh, what i'd really like to do next actually is a history book as a non-fiction um, right. and for that you know i've got to write a really long mm-hmm. kind of business proposal and uh, the first 10,000 words or so as well so i've started um, and i'm hoping to to be pitching that a bit later this year and it would be wonderful to get another book deal uh, for that so uh, yeah all, all very exciting Lot, lots lots to come i hope um, when, when, if you're writing fiction and uh, non-fiction if you know if that's the plan would you want to you know would you publish under the same name would you use an initial for one of them or just do the same name for both i i try and publish under the same name i mean i know with uh there's this idea isn't there that if you stray into certain genres mm. uh, particularly kind of historical crime uh, you should um, uh, try and disguise the fact that you are a female writer, <laughs> which I always think is a bit harsh, really. And to yeah. use your initials if you're going to con readers into uh, male readers into reading <laughs> yeah. your books because they don't know that you're a woman. So I feel a bit sad if I if I had to decide to do that. But ideally, I'd, I'd write under the same name because I I feel like the two. Um, the two disciplines uh, cross fertilize each mm-hmm. other and are equally valid. And actually, I find while I have to be careful writing both, um, there are a lot of um, pitfalls. I have to try and remember, uh, you know, which sort of facts are much more rooted in the historical record and which elements of particularly the characters I've are slightly more the, the conjurings of my own imagination. So I, I do have to be careful. Mm-hmm. But if I'm careful, that I, I find that there's, you know, the two can really complement each other. So I find that for my fiction writing, it, it's so helpful that I have the academic background and the and and I'm doing the academic research at the same time because that could, can give such authenticity to the fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my colleagues said when they read the Puritan Princess that they felt it was it felt more like fictionalized academic history than a lot of historical fiction, which feels like fictionalized popular history. That might sound completely like it doesn't make any sense at all, but in a sense, what he was trying to say was that he could see the layers underneath the book or which were trying to kind of get across the fault lines in current scholarship you know what mm-hmm. are the what are the debates going on at the moment yeah. among historians about this period yeah. what do we know what don't we know what do we what do we wonder about and i really tried to get those into the book so the, the research i think really helps my fiction writing but i think also um, i'm taking back to my historical work some of the insights and the intimacy that I've I've gained um, through writing about this period from a fictional point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, it's amazing how when you you can look at the same source or fact or even a family tree, and if you look at it as a historian, you see some things, and if you try and look at it as a novelist, you see other yeah. things. Um, and I I would love for um, the insights I have on both sides to cross over and um, improve my writing in the other genre yeah. as well. 
No, that sounds that sounds great. Awesome. What was the last book that you read? Oh, okay. So uh, I, I've read quite a lot of books recently. I've just read To Calais in Ordinary Time, um, which is historical fiction. James Meek, I think, <laughs> which was which was very good. Uh, and um, I'm also ha- reading at the moment some non-fiction because I've, I'm, I'm doing a book review for the History Today of, of a right. book um, <clears throat> which is about London in the 17th century. Um, so I'm reading that, uh, Margaret, Margaret Lincoln, I think it is, um, at the moment as well. So uh, I have a very eclectic uh, <laughs> bedside table. <laughs> it, it goes from everything from kind of crime and uh, lo- locked room mysteries through to historical fiction, through to, uh, you know, Jilly Cooper, through to <laughs> um, uh, non-fiction, you know, you, you name it. <laughs> and uh, what about the last film you watched? Oh, the last film I watched. Well, I actually watched Groundhog Day last night because it was Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. I think that's a fair answer because that's, that's a fantastic. Film. I mean, it's a classic. Film to watch. Yeah, exactly. No, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, that's great. It's, it's a classic. It's a classic film. I've not uh, actually watched that for years. I, I probably I should have watched it last night, obviously. But yeah, that was. Uh, yeah, that's a film of me I to think watch it's again. on. Um, I think we watched it on Netflix because they put it up because it was at Groundhog Day, and I've seen it lots of times. But you know, it it, it it's aged very well. It's very very. Yeah, well. it's, I watched it a few months ago with with my daughters, and they enjoyed yeah. it as well. So yeah, it's all oh, good. Introducing it to them. Exactly, that's <laughs> giving them film education. <laughs> um, oh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting to that stage with. My 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 son i mean my oldest son is four so we're not quite <laughs> i know yeah. I, I i i try and push them early sometimes oh, I mean, my wife is often like they can't watch that <laughs> <What are> you... <laughs> scream tonight is it mark yeah that's right yeah nightmare on elm street <laughs> no, I, I think it's good to be aspirational and kind of push them forward exactly it's exactly still in the mary poppins uh you know sort of stage <laughs> Um, of, of films with uh, with him, but um, and Frozen and oh yeah, and yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, my my husband's already planning the the film clubs we're gonna have. Um, he's, very, <laughs> he's very into his film film history. So yeah, excellent, sure it's exciting ones down the line. And uh, what was the last TV show that you watched or are watching? Ah, I'm watching Call My Agent at the moment. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, oh yeah. I love, and my husband and I feel very smug and not a little aggrieved about this because we were fans from the outset. <laughs> <laughs> we watched the first series last year or the year before, whenever it was, um, and it sort of slipped under the radar. And then this latest series has been all in the mm-hmm. all in the review sections with the people reviewers saying, "Oh, this is wonderful! Everyone watched it." We we're like, "We know that we're already watching." It. <laughs> um, True fans. So, yeah, re- really, really enjoying that. Um, and actually, it's quite funny because obviously it's about it's about a, a, a an agency, a, a film agency um, in Paris. Um, and I think obviously film agents have a slightly different life from literary <laughs> yeah. agents, <laughs> yeah. I imagine. But I get a bit of a kick out of imagining that my agent is running around, um, you know, buzzing around London on a on a scooter, you know, <laughs> stars slipping on banana skins and all sorts of things <laughs> happening. I mean, that's the life I'm I'm looking forward to once we're all released from lockdown. I hope it's yeah, going to be a good life. And uh, the very, very last thing we do is a quick fire, either or, and uh, there's no right answer, <laughs> possibly one. Okay, um, so I'm, so... I'm, I'm on the couch with a therapist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What do you see if you look at the exactly, yeah. Yeah. shark test? Yeah. <laughs> um, so the first one is Philippa Gregory or CJ Sansom. Oh, CJ Sansom. But both. I mean, love both. Yeah. But but yeah, CJ Sansom is is, and he's a lawyer too. He's a, he's a, he's a lawyer. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But Shard Lake, what a creation! Oh, just 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 love him. So uh, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> nice. Uh, TV or cinema? TV at the moment, because um, the cinemas are closed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Suicide, facetious answer. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I mean, again, both, but t- TV at the moment is where things are at, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, uh, yeah if, if you'd asked me five years ago, I probably would have said cinema. All right. Uh, early bird or night owl? Oh, God, night owl. Massive, massive night owl. Um, I work best in the afternoon and the evening, actually. 
Um, and uh, I, if, if I didn't have small children, I would <laughs> lie in very late <laughs> and stay up very late working. Um, so uh, sadly, I have to live on a slightly more nursery timetable yep. <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> Fair enough. Definitely a night out. Um, and uh, last one, uh, audiobook or ebook? Audiobook. Um, I... I grew up listening to audiobooks. Um, again, before they were fashionable, my mother has the biggest collection of cassette audiobooks, which are yep. completely redundant now, um, that you would ever imagine. I mean, across the whole walls of mm-hmm. one whole room. Um, and as a child, I loved going to sleep listening to uh, Just William, Wind in the Willows, mm-hmm. all those classic um, audiobooks. And I still love them and find them therapeutic i listen to them all the way through my finals exams you know if i'm if i'm stressed worried or can't sleep it's got to be an audiobook yeah and the, Pur- the puritan princess is available in audiobook oh well, perfect, a- a- never perfect and, e-book and e-book so whichever answer <laughs> your listeners have you know you're sorted <laughs> well, it's funny audiobooks have definitely had a kind of resurgence i think with audible and the you know podcast the rise of podcasts and of people getting used to spoken word i think more than ever and it's great to see it come back in, in such a big way it's wonderful isn't it and and i mean yeah. you're part of the podcast boom which is just so so exciting right write that all the way yeah <laughs> number one <laughs> some you way to go you, yet Tara. Keep, keep going you can do it <laughs> <laughs> That, that was a really fun chat and, and a really um, interesting point as you said about the whole the rise and fall and rise again of audiobooks. I yeah. remember as a kid uh, having on tapes and then CDs audiobooks and then they kind of fell away and for years as I grew up you never saw them anywhere and and they were the kind of thing you maybe get in a long road trip or something but they've really come back with audible. Technology. Yeah it is, it is odd isn't it I don't know if it was do you think, I wonder if it was something to do with the sort of fall of cassette players, because when yeah, it was cassettes, maybe. kids had Walkman, and so they could listen to these things on their own, but somehow on a CD, I don't know, it just didn't seem to be the same thing. Uh, I suppose yeah. Discmans weren't as big a thing as a Walkman. Where, no, I certainly had a number of tape players, you know, and then, and I don't think I ever, or maybe I had one or two, but never, you're, but you're right, like a CD player, a portable CD player, yeah. was never a big thing for me as it was for, for like a, a tape player. Yeah, I wonder if it's something to do with that, but definitely audiobooks have come back in a big way, and I, I'm a big fan of them, especially, you know, we've spoken to a lot of guests this year who have said they've been having difficulty reading because of everything mm-hmm. that's going on, but audiobooks is a way back into that because you can put them on yeah. while you're doing other stuff, and it does... If the narrator's good, as we've discussed before, it can whisk you away into that world quite quickly. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder if it's something to do with the rise of podcasts over the last 10 years or so. You know, folk have gotten mm-hmm. really used to spoken word stuff and uh, I, I don't know. But yeah, it, it's, it, but I'm all for it. It's excellent news that it's back. Cause, um, yeah, definitely. All great stuff. Rise of podcasts like this one, perhaps. I mean, this is probably the best podcast I've ever listened to. <laughs> 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 Who are we kidding? It's dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but no, uh, thank you to Miranda for taking the time to come on to the podcast. We really enjoyed speaking to her. And, um, you know, as I said at the start, I thought it was really interesting chatting to her about writing historical fiction, which is something that I am also wanting to do at the moment. But, you know, that point about the difference between authenticity and accuracy when you're writing something down is, when you're writing a story, I think, is is very important because I think if you're striving to be 100% accurate all the time you can sometimes lose the reader but if you're giving that yeah, authentic totally. sense of the time through the writing then the, you'll you'll you know that's what adds to the flavor of the story and pulls you in yeah personally I I don't really have a problem if someone if something I'm reading is not 100% historically accurate if a I know it's a book it's a it's a novel that I'm reading and not an encyclopedia or not a factual book on, on the subject and B, as long as it's accurate in the sense of the emotions that it's portraying or the, mm-hmm. or the, the historical time or the characters and the you know I, I think if, if, if the character is a made-up character or someone's in a different location where they should be that kind of stuff I don't really have a problem with obviously there's within limits you can't change yeah. everything but I think as long as you get the real gist of the story and the gist of the time and it's and, and, and it's making you feel the emotions that you should be feeling from what really happened, then 
I don't really have a problem with it. I don't think. I, Unless I mean, obviously it's a textbook. But it, yeah. yeah, yeah. If it, I think that's the that's the thing. If it, as long as it's not portraying itself as a as a historical record, then yeah, exactly. you can do. I, I think the rules are you can be as act, you can be very you can hew very very close to what actually happened, or you can veer off entirely, and that. You know, there's there's things like Fatherland, where uh, by Robert mm-hmm. Harris, which you know um, it takes a very different turn of history, but it's still yeah. what you would class perhaps as historical fiction, albeit alternate historical fiction. Yeah, totally. Because I think a lot of the facts that come out of it are probably accurate mm-hmm. facts. They're just portrayed in, or told in a different manner. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, um, well, uh, as I say, thanks very much to Miranda. We recorded that uh, just before. Uh, the paperback for the Puritan Princess came out, so you can pick that up now. Um, and uh, her second book, as she said, will be out in September, so uh, do watch out for that one. Yes, and um, next week we have another fantastic guest coming on. We have Empire Magazine's uh, self proclaimed geek queen, Helen O'Hara, who's written a number of books, and her newest one is Women versus Hollywood which uh, I've read and it's a really, really interesting read and certainly one I recommend everyone who's got a passing interest in films or the the current kind of political climate with the Me Too movement, etc. It's a really interesting look back at the role of women in, in the film industry yeah. um, right back to the silent movie era. And we, we also chat to Helen about, you know, writing reviews and how how you hone your craft in that sort of thing as well and um, so it's it's a really interesting and fun chat as well Helen's, Helen's great fun to chat to as yeah. you may know if you've listened to the Empire podcast um, where she is a fixture and it's always worth listening to well I hope you enjoyed that episode if you did please leave a comment down below hit that thumbs up button and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below and if you want to get in touch you can always drop us a tweet in the twitter machine which is at uk page one as evidenced here and our other social media channels are available otherwise we hope to see you next episode see you later